Welcome back to Bali Today. I'm sitting here with filmmaker Jane Walters, and we're going to talk a little bit about her movie, Bali, Hope in Paradise. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How long have you been here in Bali? I've been here for 13 years. Wow, it's a long time. Yes, it is, but it goes quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it does. What brought you to Bali initially? Um, I met my husband in Tokyo. I was yeah. living in Japan for about three years, and he had been there for 13 years. Yeah. As we met, and uh, he brought me to paradise, sight unseen. I moved here. And you hadn't been to Bali no, before? No, I'd right. never been. So he said he, he had bought a small hotel, and he right. asked me to join him. And I thought, why not, you well, know, okay. <laughs> leave the big city, go yeah. to, to an island, and the rest is history. We have a couple of kids now, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, built a nice life here. I believe you were there when the bomb actually went off. Yeah, um, we were there the night of the bombing. I was with a friend of mine, an old schoolmate from university. We had studied together, and we heard something had happened in Kuta. Yeah. So we went back home. We were very close to the house, grabbed the video camera, which I hadn't taken out in about two years since I had moved here, and um, just went to the site. And it started filming. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, I mean, we had to walk in because, it, you know, the yeah. power had gone out yeah. and there's a lot of smoke and haze. It was very difficult to see our way through. And like I said, as you came in, there were um, buildings, mm -hmm. you know, the windows had been blown out, mm -hmm. a lot of glass shattered on the streets. And then as we entered into closer to the actual site, then you could see the flames. flames yeah. Most of the people had gone, but there were a few people who were, you know, left mm -hmm. stunned yeah. and nowhere to go, still kind of roaming around on the street. Yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a shocking night. I remember myself that that particular night I was going to a party at the Macaroni Club, which was very close to, yes. to the Sari Club. Anyway, we, we set out to go there, and I thought it was a bit too early. I didn't want to be like the first person to arrive at the party. So we stopped at a, at a bar in Petitanga to have a couple of drinks before going on. And all of a sudden, everybody's mobile phones started going off, and there was police sirens and ambulances racing past. So we knew something had happened, and of course, word came very quickly that the bomb had happened. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, I think there was a lot of information happening then. That's how we found Fe out as well. Same Text thing. messages. Yeah. But nobody, uh, people didn't know it was a bomb. They were thinking it was elect like a transformer yeah. or some kind of power we, we surge. Were, we were told it was a, a gas cooker thing exploded, yeah. first of all. Then, of course, we found out it was a bomb. Yeah. So this obviously started your interest in the whole thing. Yeah, so we went there with a the camera. It yeah. was my friend that actually was doing the filming. I kind of took on the producing mm. role where I was contacting the networks. I right. met um, two guys came up to us with, you know, their skin was just bubbling, mm. and they were Australian staying in the Tropicana Hotel, which right. had burnt down. Yeah. So all their passports, belongings were there. So I brought them back to my hotel, and we gave them medical attention, and then my friend continued to film. But of course, since my camera hadn't been running, the batteries weren't well, that's charged. What I was to we weren't prepared. Yeah, yeah so we just um, did as much as we could, and then we, were in contact with the mm. TV stations, and then we started, you know, then that was a three-day process of working with Reuters right. for three days to cover the story, yeah. because um, obviously no news crews yeah. could get in. Now, the film itself, Hope in, in Paradise, isn't really about the bombing. The, it starts with the bombing, yeah. but it's about the recovery. How did you get involved with that? Yeah, well, actually, you know, after doing the film, after all that footage going on television, mm -hmm and seeing the reaction of, of the media. They were covering a lot of the Australian victims mm. and a lot of international guests and tourists. And I was left thinking, what about the Balinese people? What about the Indonesian people who have been here? Yes, exactly. So after about a month, I mean, I followed the cleansing ceremony. Mm. I filmed that and everything. And um, then I got in contact with um, some of the uh, foundations that were helping, which was, you know, quite a few popped up after yeah. that. You know, a lot of international aid came in and a lot of people who were friends of Bali wanted to support. Mm. So, um, yeah, I got in touch with um, a group, the widows, mm. Mm -hmm. and um, I was just amazed to see their stories and this see how, yeah. how, they're, you know, how they were coping because, yeah, you know, their life had been just pulled right out under them. Because yeah. this is what your film actually concentrates. It's, it's, it's the widows whose lives, well, their family life, just suddenly comes to this abrupt end yeah. and they have to recover you know, and find a, a new way to survive yeah. without and a husband. Not, and absolutely. All and you know, the society here, the yeah. husband is the bread earner, it, you know, and the woman, she didn't know how to go to the bank or do yeah. these kind of things. So there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of struggle and hardship for them to how yeah. are they going to take care of the, their kids and everything. Mm -hmm. 
And so after I met Sri, who mm, this was, is the lady who founded the organization. Yes, Sri, Sri Anna Kabon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's half Balinese and half Australian. So she was kind of the perfect mix, you know. Yeah. She she understood the Bali side, but she was very connected with Australia, mm. and um, she was a she was a really nice kind of medium between, you know, the two places. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also she um, was doing translating at the court for right. the trials, mm. and she met a lot of the journalists, and she met a lot of the victims, Australian victims, and so she really bridged them with the local ones, and yeah. it was a really nice meeting of of them all. I mean, they'd all experienced it in different ways. But it was a nice um, time for them to join together. As, as the film progresses, you're, you sort of like take a sidetrack to a certain extent with these yeah. two young children who, who are sort of orphaned and left in this terrible situation. Well, it, it, yeah, it's a sidetrack, but it's part of the story because yeah. the children ended up in the care of her and yeah. the Yayasan, yeah, yeah. the charity. So when that happened, she actually was very interested in me to film what was happening, also just as a record of what was happening, I mean, because she was already, she was young as well. She mm. was only 21. So here she is taking these kids, kids on in yeah. a bad situation, so she wanted to do everything properly. Yeah. So, so I was there kind of just documenting it yeah. for but her, and then it turned into another side story, another story, like you say. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a really interesting story, because these, they have an Iranian father who's, refugee in detention yeah. in, in Australia yeah. the mother's been killed they've been brought up by these Balinese people yeah. you know, and no one will take responsibility for them the Iranian, the Australian the Indonesian governments none of them really want to know these children so they're like homeless yeah it was and, and then a lot of prominent uh, Australians you know yeah. like a member of parliament a magistrate got involved because they were like well we just want to bring the kids to Australia yeah. and when they got refused it stirred yeah. up more emotion and, mm. you know, this is my country, I should be able to invite who I want into my country. Yeah. And um, that's where it kind of turned a bit political. And, right. you know. But it's an interesting part of the, of the movie. Mm. It's really good. Now, what happened to the movie? You made this in, I think, 2003 or four. Yeah, we started in 2002. We right. finished just in the beginning of 2004, yeah. just in time for a film festival because I had, okay. I had sent the trailer to the festival and they yeah. were like, finish it, you know, we really want you to put, submit your film. Which which film festival was this? It was the Independent New York um, Film oh, okay. and Video Festival, right. and it was um, yeah, it was a fabulous festival. It yeah. was in spring, so we I just had time to finish Could it, you? send the tape in, and um, they said, yeah, we want you, so come. Yeah. And you went to New York. We yeah. went to New York. It was my first trip ever, right. my first film, so it was quite exciting. Yeah. And um, yeah, we ended up winning Best International wow. Film. Wow. Fantastic. So that was, yeah, it was exciting. We didn't get to stay till the end for the awards because we were, you know, a lot of us came and we had yeah. to get back to Bali. And, uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, we got there. Did you get the award eventually? Is it I sitting did. on the mantle? Yeah, place? I did. They didn't send it for quite a while. And I was like, oh, is there a award? And then they brought it. It was a small one. I thought, wow. <laughs> so do you have any other future projects? Yes, yeah, so I'm just doing some, I'm doing mostly charity kind of um, right. videos now for people that are would like to expose their their organization okay. or looking for more funding. So I'm doing one with um, a company in Singapore on orphanages. Yeah. And I'm now doing one with um, David Booth from the East Bali Poverty Project. Okay, yeah. It's a fantastic project. Okay. So I'm going to help him re-edit some stuff. We can look forward to that. Yeah. Then. Okay, thanks for thanks. joining us today. Thanks for having me. Okay. We're going to have a look at some, some excerpts from Jane's film. On the 12th of October, 2002, Bali, the island of the gods, was changed forever. But from all the devastation and carnage that killed more than 200 innocent people would emerge a genuine heroine. Asriana Kabon, known as Sri, daughter of an Australian mother and Balinese father. Just 21 years old, Sri felt a calling to help those victims the rest of the world had forgotten. The Balinese themselves. Have people forgotten the Balinese people? Have they forgotten that it's their island? This film is her story. How her selfless dedication made a crucial difference to some who might otherwise have had little hope at all. No, I mean, I had so many friends and relatives that, um, that go out on Saturday night and they go into that area. I mean, just the feeling of not being here in Bali and knowing that there was all this panic happening 
While international media attention focused on the overseas victims, many Balinese, dazed and in shock, melted back into their villages in the countryside, far from the reach of Western aid agencies. Sri felt a special affinity with these people. Married to a Balinese prince, and herself the daughter of a Brahmana, the highest priestly caste whose lineage can be traced through 800 years of Balinese history, Sri felt compelled to do something. I felt it was my obligation as I had married into the royal family here that I needed to help my people and also to bring attention to the victims and to bring attention to the Balinese people and, and to find out what they needed. When at last she was able to return to Bali, Sri finally met Jeff and Sian Thwaites face to face. After comparing their philosophies and aims, it was quickly confirmed that Sri was the perfect choice to head the newly formed foundation Zero to One in Bali. Sri made innumerable phone calls and scoured lists as she set about finding survivors not yet accounted for. Her in-depth knowledge of Balinese village life and language helped her seek out people beyond the reach of the foreign agencies. As she delved deeper, Sri became acutely aware that there was a group of secondary victims, widows and children, left distraught and virtually destitute by one awful twist of fate. I went out into the communities and I met the widows and they were very, very traditional women from the Balinese villages and they had no modern life skills. They'd only ever been a, uh, a housewife. They just did the cooking, looked after their husband, looked after their children. So I've kind of had to help them come into reality. I mean, they're just your basic housewife that suddenly they've lost their husband and they don't know what to do. Balinese culture and religion involve a rich tapestry of pageants, plays and ceremonies that permeate every facet of Balinese life. In addition to basic monthly support, these widows were given the opportunity to undergo training in the elaborate costuming and makeup for these important events. This outfit that we're doing now it used to be traditionally only for the royal family to wear, but because of the change in era, now everybody wears it. Possessing none of the necessary skills to begin with, the learning process for these women involves many months of dedicated study. The goal is to be able to open a salon run by these women providing the specialized makeup and costuming for these ceremonies and incorporating a training center so that they in turn can pass these skills on to other underprivileged women. Gradually they begin to master their new art form.